Thank you for plugging into this Family Life News podcast, streaming issues-driven, family-focused news. This is Faith Under Fire. Each Thursday on Family Life, we give voice to religious battlegrounds in this nation. I'm your host, Tracy Lynn. With us today, Episcopalian Bishop William Love. He serves in the Albany, New York Diocese. What does Scripture speak when it comes to marriage? I think Scripture speaks very clearly. In in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus was asked a question about divorce and when was it appropriate for a person to divorce a spouse. And Jesus Quoting from Genesis 1, 27 to 28, and also Deuteronomy 2, 24, part of the creation account, Jesus said, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made the male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. In answering that question about divorce, he was in fact also indicating God's intent for marriages between a man and a woman, and that was from the very beginning of creation. And uh, I don't believe anything has changed in their life. Society has gone in a different direction. Yeah, his word stands. During the month of June, the Episcopal Church has hosted a hearing over your decision to not allow gay marriages within the Albany Diocese. Would you summarize the process and their reasoning behind it? It's called a hearing, but in reality, it's a trial. And originally, it was supposed to have taken place back in April of this year. And because of the coronavirus, it was postponed. And ultimately, they decided to go forward with a virtual online meeting. It all goes back to the General Convention of 2018. The General Convention of the Episcopal Church meets once every three years. And in the summer of 2018, they passed a resolution called B012, which essentially was introduced as a compromise for those that wanted to ensure that same-sex marriages were allowed and authorized within the Episcopal Church, and and they felt that the way to do that was through changing the prayer book. But then there were others that were supportive of same-sex marriages, but were not interested in changing the prayer book. B012 was presented as a compromise between those two groups to try to force myself and the other theologically conservative and Orthodox bishops in the Episcopal Church to allow for same-sex marriages in our diocese. There are 101 dioceses in the Episcopal Church, and all but about seven or eight of us had agreed, but the seven or eight theologically conservative bishops said no. We recognize this is going on in other parts of the church, but we are not authorizing it. And so this B012 is presented as an attempt to force the issue. And ultimately, I decided that I was not able to go along with that. And so in November of 2018, I issued a pastoral letter to the clergy and people of the Diocese of Albany explaining why I was unable to abide by the General Convention Resolution and also issued a pastoral directive, which ultimately forbade any of the clergy from officiating the same-sex marriages within the diocese or church property for being used for those purposes. That's what got me in trouble with the National Episcopal Church. And in January of 2019, the presiding bishop partially inhibited my ministry forbidding me from taking any type of action against clergy in the diocese that wanted to participate in same-sex marriages. And I challenged that, and that's what ultimately led to this trial. And this trial is not looking specifically at what the Bible says about marriage, but really the process of your refuting what the National Conference has done. That's correct. While I believe the Holy Scripture has very clearly stated that same-sex marriage is not part of God's design or intent. There are obviously many people in the Episcopal Church that believe just the opposite of that. And because I refused to abide by General Convention Resolution, that's why they were bringing charges against me. However, it's interesting that in the specific canon that they mentioned, which says 
that I failed to abide by the promises and vows made when I was ordained. And they're using that as the grounds for the actions that they have taken against me. Just prior to that statement, it says that uh, in exercising his or her ministry, a minister, a member of the clergy shall conform to the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer, which the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer have not been changed. They indicate that marriage is between a man and a woman. The marriage service in the Book of Common Prayer has not changed. It, too, indicates that marriage is between a man and a woman. And several other places in, in the prayer book reference marriage as between a man and a woman. So the official teaching of the Church has not changed. They're taking action to authorize or allow for same-sex marriages, but they haven't changed the things that need to be changed in order for that to become official or legal. So what does this look like for you on a daily basis right now? And then what's the next step in this trial process? Day-to-day life, I'm continuing to exercise my ministry as a bishop. The only thing that I've been restricted in, again, is that if another clergy person were to participate in a same-sex marriage, I could not take any type of action against them in terms of punishment. I'm still waiting to find out what the verdict will be that the uh, the one-day hearing or trial was held back in June. They have not indicated when the verdict will actually be handed down. So pretty much I and the diocese are in a waiting period to find out what that will be and then the implications from that. If they rule in my favor, then there's the opportunity for someone within the church to appeal it, and then if the trial continues, if they vote against me, then I could theoretically appeal it. I haven't decided whether I would do that or not. So are there same-sex marriages happening right now within the Albany Diocese? To the best of my knowledge, no. I'm aware of one that occurred several months ago, given the restrictions placed upon me, I wasn't able to respond to that. But our diocesan canons forbid same-sex marriages. So again, in taking this stance that I did, I was in reality upholding the teaching of the Episcopal Diocese of Albany, which is still the official teaching of the Episcopal Church, as well as the vast majority of the rest of Christendom. And still what the Word of God says. Yes. (laughs) You don't strike me as a confrontational gentleman, and yet I applaud you for standing and holding fast to what God's Word says. Bill, why is this a battle within the Church when following biblical doctrine? And that's a very good question. I guess uh, part of the problem is that people have a different interpretation of what Holy Scripture actually says regarding this. I, I think God has been quite clear, not only in the creation account in terms of understanding of marriage and, and sexual relations between a man and a woman, but also in the passage from Leviticus and, and Paul's letter to the Romans. Again, God clearly speaks about the inappropriateness of same-sex relationships, but, but there are those that believe that God through the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing in our generation, and that this is a justice issue, and that if justice is to take place, then the Church must allow for and authorize the blessing of same-sex marriages. Hmm. I would argue it is a justice issue. However, we are doing our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters in Christ a great disservice by encouraging them to participate or behave in a behavior I'm making a distinction between orientation and the physical act of sexual intimacy. And I believe that for the Church to say it's okay and to encourage those who have same-sex attractions to engage in sexual intimacy, I believe we are doing them a great disservice. Jesus said that it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the depths of the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble and fall and fall into sin. And I think that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, I feel like we get caught up in the emotion of it all and the feeling, and we need to go beyond feeling and dig into what God says in His Word. And knowing that it's not because He's mean, it's because He knows what that road leads to, whether it's a sexual sin or other types of sin like greed, whatever. He knows that when we take that path, it's ultimately bad for us and bad for those around us. That's exactly true. 
perfect example, again, is, is the woman who was caught in adultery. She was surrounded by all these guys with stones in their hand, ready to stone her to death. And yet when Jesus challenged them and said, okay, who amongst you is without sin? Go ahead and throw the first stone. And ultimately they were convicted of their own sinfulness. It may not have been adultery, but their own sinfulness and brokenness. And ultimately they each dropped their stones and walked away. And and Jesus said, well, where are they? And she said, there's no one. And, And Jesus said, well, neither do I condemn you. But he didn't say it's okay to go back to that way of life, but rather he said, neither do I condemn you, but now go and no longer commit sin. Bishop, do you have any parting words for our listeners? Maybe there's someone who's struggling with a same-sex attraction, or just a reminder of any sin as we move forward, as you move forward in this battle to uphold the word of truth. We're all sinners, every one of us. We may pick and choose our sins, but every one of us are in need of God's love and mercy and forgiveness and redeeming grace. And for those that may be struggling with same-sex attractions, I just encourage you to offer that to the Lord and invite Him into those struggles. This is such a sensitive issue and such an emotionally charged issue, and our sexuality is so much a part of our being that it has just created havoc within our society. And for Far too long, people with same-sex attractions were abused in ways that they never should have been. And the church, unfortunately, participated in a lot of that. So there were past injustices, but I think now we're going to the opposite extreme. And rather than dealing with past injustices, we are creating new ones. I constantly remind my fellow bishops and others that I believe ultimately most of us want the same thing for same-sex attracted brothers and sisters to know how best to share God's love with them and how best to minister to them. The problem is we have a different understanding of what that looks like. For some, it is to embrace them in that and and to encourage them in that lifestyle. And and for others of us, it is, is to acknowledge the lifestyle and to assure them of God's love and forgiveness, but but not to act in ways that God, through Holy Scripture, has said is inappropriate and not part of His original design. That's Bishop William Love. I'm Tracy Lynn, Family Life News.